Good morning, good morning, good morning, everybody. Lumberjack Landlord here. Let's talk about some real estate and some fun stuff. Super excited to get going this morning. It is 2024 and we are heading in hot. Lots of projects this year, lots of big stuff. My biggest project ever will be in 2024. Um, certainly from a rehab perspective, it's over a million dollar rehab and yeah, to get a million dollar rehab, that means there's lots of square footage. Um, so it's going to be absolutely awesome. I'm really very, very, very looking forward to it. Um, a little bit scared, a little bit scared. Um, there's some things that I've never done before <clears throat> in, uh, in this rehab. Uh, I've never done a sprinkler system before. So usually my buildings are small enough where they don't need a sprinkler system or there's already one that's there and, and been installed and intact. Um, and so, yeah, so I'm a little bit concerned, but what I wanted to talk to you guys about today was really learning to earn in 2024. Um, you guys might've seen the notice, but we're actually, uh, the, the boot camp was wildly successful, uh, in 2023, wildly successful. We had sellouts for every single boot camp. Um, and it's again, because we limit it. The goal here isn't cash grab where it's like, Hey, let's get as many people into this meeting as we possibly can. That's not the way I want to do it. I want to keep it 15 to 18 people a week for that 12 week period that ensures that you get your questions answered on a regular basis. So if you're going on a journey and you're doing a project, perfect opportunity, perfect opportunity, jump in the boot camp. Let's hang out. Let's talk. Let's get advice from other investors that are also in the group that have also done rehabs before. This is an awesome opportunity to get in a group, talk with like-minded people, talk with people of all the different varied levels of experiences. We do everything in that boot camp. We certainly cover course stuff, but the other thing that we cover as well is literal uh, project updates or, or rehab stuff. So we'll get in there. We'll actually share, people will share pictures of a property and then I can walk through it with them virtually and say, yeah, I mean, these are the things that I would want to update. These are the things that you're going to want to, you know, invest in, or, Hey, this is actually not too bad. I wouldn't, I wouldn't bother with that. Um, so I think that there's a huge, huge opportunity for people to really take their game to the next level. If you've always done turnkey, it's time to level up. If you've always done stuff, which was like kind of lipstick rehab time that you can level up. This is what the boot camp is there for. It's so people can reach out and say, Hey, I have a question about this, or I, you know, I, I saw this this week on the job. You know, am I getting my, am, am I getting charged too much? Uh, is the, is the contractor screwing me over? There's plenty of great contractors out there. There's plenty of bad ones too. Same thing as landlords, same thing as tenants. It's just like anything else. So hopefully in 2024, you will learn so you can earn more. Um, the idea is, is I'd love to hear people that are telling me that their, you know, return rates, their return on capital rates are in the 20% area. That's where I live. And I live there because I understand exactly how to optimize my business and run it the way that I do. So as we talk about REI at its best, it's the opportunity that I think a lot of people don't necessarily really understand. It is, if you're buying only from, uh, from MLS, the challenge that you're going to have is that everybody else is seeing that. And in all honesty, I'm probably going to see it before you. I'm probably going to see it. If we're competing in the same market, I'm probably going to see it before you. And here's why. I'm still up at midnight at night because I'm insane. And so I actually see things that hit MLS at 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 o'clock at night when a broker might be putting those things in because that's a lot of times when productive brokers are putting things in that are really early in the morning. I'm seeing all that stuff. I'm not waiting for alerts. So very often before stuff has been truly live in MLS for any amount of time, I've already been on site, I've already had a showing, and I've already made an offer. And there's multiple strategies in the market. Some are like, hey, let's wait for 60 days and wait for it to get tired. You can do that if the, if the asset is way overpriced. You can also do it because there's plenty of brokers that have no idea the real actual value of an asset. Why? Because they didn't do the homework and know that there's an ADU available on that lot. They didn't do the homework and know that uh, it's actually, it used to be a duplex. They didn't do the homework and know that 
um, that you can actually use it as a boarding house and charge by the room. They didn't know, they didn't know, they didn't know. Well, that's what I know about my market. And so when they list it, we bought a property that was listed for $165,000. The property line was wrong. It had twice the lot size. So that made it eligible for an ADU. I knew that because I do my homework and I understand and I know, and I know my area. They didn't. So I bought it for $165,000. I've got really good news. It just appraised for $330,000. And that was only about a year and a half ago. And so while prices have gone up a little bit, more thing that's gone up is, um, you know, rents. Rents have gone up more than, than, than the actual asset values. So when we look at, at least in my area. So when we look at that stuff, that thing, that building that I bought, day one, I almost doubled, actually about doubled my, uh, my value about doubled. You know, they looked at it as a old house, tons of work, estate sale. Let's get out of it. We, we don't want to have to deal with it. We don't have to manage it during the winter time. So I did. And so now I'm ahead. I'm ahead. I'm playing with 150 grand of the house's money or 160 grand of the house's money. It's pretty good. So we're going to, we actually have agents that have reached out to me saying, Hey, what are you doing with this property? We did some touch up on the roof. We did some touch up on the siding. Um, we're going to do some things inside, but nothing crazy, nothing crazy. Like we can do it for probably about 15 to 20 grand. And the place is going to be completely new and fabulous and available probably in March. Even if the economy is not doing very well, even if the market has shifted, we're still so into the money. It's not even funny. Six figures. How many of you would like to make six figures on one deal? Now I could rent it and I could keep it long-term, but it's a single family home. So I don't really love single families. They don't really cash flow. Even though I bought it for what I bought it for, the taxes are still kind of high. You know, taxes are like 70,000 bucks. So it gets kind of expensive. So I think my best move is I can sell it. I can pay my short-term capital gains tax, 20%. I could 1031 it and I could take the money that I get from that asset and I can put it into another one. And here's the cool thing. The money from that one asset would likely buy me a half million dollar duplex that would net me two to $3,000 a month. So I'm not married to these assets. They're assets. I like them and I know, you know, it's fun getting to know a building and kind of the character that the building has, but you guys need to earn so you can learn more. That means creating more deals just by your network, but also by your skills. If you can do a heavy rehab versus only being able to buy turnkey, guess what? The number of properties that you're looking at and that you have the ability to buy probably triple or quadruple, right? How cool is that? That's where I think too often people get pigeonholed into, hey, I'm only going to buy off of MLS. Okay, fine. But now you need to buy the spectrum. Now you need to be able to buy from different parts of the town or even another town. Or you need to buy a different type of asset class in that market. Maybe it's mixed use that for some reason the numbers are really off on. Maybe it's two, three, and four units, which by the way, consistently most markets improperly value. Most markets improperly value two, three, and four unit properties the most. You can get into the more dangerous game because it really is commercial. You can get into the more dangerous game because rates aren't fixed. And I don't love those deals for newer investors unless you have a bunch of investment behind you. But, you know, you're probably going to learn some lessons there. And I like to learn less expensive lessons. So the thing that I would challenge you guys with today is please, obviously, if you've taken the course, fantastic. If you haven't taken the course, I'd love to have you there. As far as the boot camp goes, it's going to go to $1,000. It's going to $9.95 at the end of January. I'm not stopping at this time. We did a full year. We proved out the model. Everybody got a ton of value. In fact, we had so much value that we have 30% of our students that are coming back and doing the boot camp again. 30% are doing it again. Now, it's none of the students that owned zero rentals. They're all students that own rentals. But 30, almost 30 percent, over 30 percent of our students are coming back and doing the boot camp again. It's that valuable. So I'm excited to have you guys there in the boot camp. Excited to talk to you about stuff today. But again, in 2024, you need to really focus to learn something so you can earn more. And that is 
taking the next level in the different assets that you're looking at, taking the next step and trying to better understand what a more complex rehab might be. There is going to be value there. There's going to be value add there. And then you also want to make sure that you have the processes in place. I thought it was awesome. And one of the message boards, and I, I answer so many questions out there. So forgive me, I don't remember which one. But somebody said something about an improvement that they needed to make to the building. And it might have been knob and two wiring. It might have been something like that. But when we talked about it, I just said, you know what you really have to be careful of that I always looked at was if that turns into a problem where insurance companies, a number of them won't write insurance on knob and tube wiring. If you find one that does, it's usually a huge premium, huge premium. And I think we all have heard the insurance conversations now. I mean, the insurance companies are de-risking heavy, which means much higher premiums and quite frankly, worse coverage. What else is new, right? They go in the opposite directions. So this investor was very smart. He recognized, he and his wife recognized, we probably need to address this issue now and just push off our next purchase. Very smart. Very smart. Because if you do that and take care of that now, it's the swan thing. Sleep well at night. One of Corby, uh, Corby Carter actually brought that up in one of our, uh, he's an alumnus of the Lumberjack Landlord University boot camp or boot camp university. Um, and it's, it's a perfect phrase sleep well at night. I want to sleep well at night. I want to sleep better at night. You sleep better knowing that issues that you know about have been taken care of and have been, have been managed. So with that being said, I look forward to an absolutely fantastic year with you guys in 2024. I'm excited to do more of the show. I'm excited to do more interaction with investors, um, and, uh, and help kind of train up that next group of elite investors going from good to great and great to elite. I look forward to being a part of that process with you guys. So without further ado, we will jump into some of the questions. It's really funny too, because I actually have, um, let me see if we got a response. We actually have, um, here it is. Uh, It's really interesting. So you guys can go and see it on the channel now. Um, there's actually somebody who, so you guys know, um, so you guys know how much I love veterans, how much we do for veterans, how much we do for single moms and things like that. And somebody had a stupid take. And so I said, that takes stupid. And he's like, be careful. I'm a veteran. And I said, doesn't mean you can't be stupid. It also doesn't mean you can't be an asshole. You are both. So the fact of the matter is, is that he didn't like the response. We all know that I love vets. You guys hear it from me every single week. We do special projects for vets. We actually do for vets, not just on the other side of it. And so he starts getting really mouthy. And so it's really funny. He's like, oh, yeah, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll see you there. And then you're dropping hints about things. And I'm like, I want to watch your tone. YouTube doesn't like that. So I think it's really interesting to see what we find very often online. And I think that. I want to say, uh, who was it that wrote something about this? Might have been Rolden, uh, Crespo, uh, might have been Chester. Might have been Chester, actually. But people talking about, you know, um, the big tough guys behind the keyboards and all this other stuff. At the end of the day, don't let them get you down. They are on their path, which is quite frankly uneventful, doesn't give any sort of return on investment. And they get angry because other people are making progress. We're making progress. We're doing great things. We're helping out tons of families, helping out tons of veterans. We're helping out the most exciting part of my newest project is the fact that we got approved ADA units. The city didn't come to me and say, Matt, would you do ADA units? They didn't. They didn't. They actually made me do a $5,000 site plan. Then they made me hire an attorney, not made me, but I had to because books this thick. I'm not going to get through that book to understand all the things that I need to do. I had to hunt to hire an architect that could actually do the work that was needed in there and set up all the measurements for everything to ensure that we had 
ADA compliant units. So he actually served on the board for the ADA for the state for 12 years. So we really took this seriously, went above and beyond and kind of, quite frankly, all in. And it was a pure gamble. I could have spent 5,000 bucks on nothing. I could have spent the other three or 4,000 bucks I spent on attorney fees on nothing. The $5,000 is what it costs to hire that architect to set up the design and everything and, and focus on those ADA units. So I'm 15,000 bucks in to creating units that are less expensive than market units because they're often on assistance. So the crazy thing is, is that I use that as an extreme example where people get offended. They show up on the channel. They say stupid things. They're of no credibility. They don't have any experience. They don't know what they're talking about. And so again, at the end of the day, be a doer, not a talker. So people that show up on this channel on Sundays, you guys are doers. You have better things to do with your time if it's just sitting down and watching fart channels like most of the people that comment on my videos in a negative way. But because you want to become great, because you want to invest in yourselves, because you want to invest in your future, your kids, or even your grandkids' future, that's why people are here. And I, it's important that landlords, as landlords, that we push the envelope, that we try and do better things, right? Like the ADA units, like I said, 14, 15,000 bucks in, they got approved. I'm ecstatic, but now I have the opportunity to spend what's probably going to be 15 to 20% more on the unit to create features that are specific to people, to Americans with disabilities. So, but it's important, right? It's important. So when you have those first floor units that don't have stairs, look at an alternate use. When you have, um, you know, the three-story townhome, guess what? That use has been kind of picked for you. But those first story downtown corridor type of units are fantastic to try to be able to create an ADA experience there that will give people, some people, their lives back. So hopefully, hopefully, you're always looking at when you're looking at these projects at best use because the best use of that space, thankfully, the town approved it. I kind of would have liked to see what would have happened if one of them didn't approve it. Um, but we won unanimously. We got a unanimous decision. I think it was 11 to nothing or 9 to nothing. I can't remember if it was 9 or 11. Um, but always do best use. But again, I bring that up because this one particular poser keeps on deciding to, you know, type stupid things. Um, and, you know, it's going to get him in trouble. Um, so at the end of the day, I encourage you guys continue to look at best use of these assets. So Kyle Dorn, you're going up on the screen. You're first. Good job. Mandy W. Good morning. All Nighter. Good morning. Lynn. Good morning. Wealth Building Journey. Good morning, Matt and everyone. Good morning, Chester. 1,000 million billion. I love the number. Uh, good morning, everyone. Hope uh, is is everyone is feeling well today. I am feeling like a champion. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, Laura. Hey, Millennial Mike. There you are, buddy. We're gonna be hanging out in the next uh, few weeks. I'm excited to excited to hang out with Mike. I think we're actually doing um, I think we're actually doing a speaking engagement on like two weeks from now. I think we're doing it not next Saturday, but the following Saturday. I think we're actually doing that. So I'm excited to do that. Um, it's, what's really funny too, is I invited this, I invited this guy, um, I invited, I invited this guy to come and hang out, um, and, and do on the live stream, but big surprise, you know, kind of a poser and backed out. Um, cause he doesn't really want to learn. He just wants to be a tough guy on the internet. Um, so yeah, kind of interesting. All right. Uh, Millennial Mike, my favorite FTE, Lumberjack Landlord. Thanks, buddy. Um, always. Full-time equivalency, a.k.a. salaried or on the clock. <laughs> They're all busting my balls now. I mean, Mike, maybe you'll finish your course before I retire. I mean, there's that. Um, wealth building journey. First you learn, then you drop the L. True story. True story. That's very good, Chester. Harry Hanover, good morning, Matt. Sunday morning real estate Java. I love it. The most deeply knowledgeable real estate dude on the web. I really appreciate that. I don't know about that. Don't know about that. Certainly the one with the most stories because I've done it wrong the first time, <laughs> but we've found a better way. Uh, wealth building journey, hit that like button. Thank you. Wealth building journey. Uh, Tamika, good to see you back. Tamika, always good to see you. 
Um, good morning, everyone. Good to see you, Lumberjack Landlord. It's been a while. Yes, I've been able to tune in regularly, but I'm here doing the work and building a solid portfolio. I love that. That's that's the best reason to miss the show. Uh, Robert Farinelli, good morning, sir. Dave, good to have you. Richard Gamino, great morning, Matt, and everyone. Good to have you guys. Robert Farinelli, for my next deal, one idea I had is call some seller's agents that tried to sell this year but then they took their properties off the market. Absolutely. 1000%. Yeah. If you find them, what your best idea is, is to not actually call the agent, call the sellers, call the sellers. Do you know why we call the sellers? Because we instantly made them 6%. They're the ones that have to pay that commission. So if you knew what it was for sale for, let's say 400,000 and the getting a 6% commission, which is 24,000, you instantly, even if you paid 376 on the 400, they got the same exact deal and you saved $24,000. See, see how awesome that is. I do that all the time, all the time. I look at stuff that, you know, was on the market then isn't on the market. I don't call the old agent F that I call the seller. Yeah, absolutely. hundred <laughs> percent without a doubt. Um, and if you guys want to know who that person is that, that leaves me all the great love notes. Um, and he said that all landlords should get real jobs. It's uh, Nicholas Gray, G-A-R-G-A-G-R-A-Y, 1765. That's his screen name. So he was reported. So if you see him bullying, I, I don't mind rude comments, but if you see him bullying anybody in, in, the, in the comment section, report him. Yeah, report him. Um. Wealth building, junior, uh, wealth building journey. Somber news. My aunt changed her permanent residence to heaven earlier Thursday morning. I'm sorry to hear that. Forgive me for being a little withdrawn today. Chester, completely understood. I just appreciate you being here. So sit back, relax. Feel free to chime in anytime. But uh, I know that uh, I know that for me, I've had a number of people pass. And I know for me, uh, staying in the habit of things helps. So uh, I'm happy to be a part of uh, happy to be a part of that for you. And uh, the good news is we know she's in a much better place. Uh, Keith Hager, good morning, folks. Good morning, sir. Uh, Tamika L., Matt, what you're suggesting is a diversification. I appreciate the wisdom you're sharing. I transitioned from primary single family home to self-managing our fourplex, definitely gaining new skills. That's awesome, Tamika. That's exactly right. Diversification is key. So I love real estate, love all kinds of real estate. But when there's a recession that hits, it happens and hits different types of, of assets. So it's like commercial real estate, right? Right now, office is getting absolutely obliterated. It's getting obliterated. But industrial storage is actually still doing really well. Companies need space to put their stuff. They need space to set up jobs. These smaller companies for guys that are branching off from these big companies, what do they need? They need industrial space. They need a 15, 18, 2200 square foot business condo. They need that stuff. That's actually doing really well. Um, there's a there's a development around us that's not built yet and it's already sold out. So all assets are not created equal. That's why I constantly talk about the fact that I don't love single family homes. I get that they work in a bunch of different states. I get that. Not speaking ill will if you're investing in single family homes. I just want the biggest bang for the buck. If you find a single family where we are, it's probably 400 to 450,000. You find a duplex with the same bedroom count in each unit, it's probably six. Which one is the better investment? The single family home does not carry that much of a premium on the rent compared to the rent that you're going to get on a duplex. So what I'm always pushing people to do is do the math. Look at it. Is that single family home that you can buy for 4 or 450, how does it compare to the duplex you can buy for 600? And that 600, if you're buying a three bed, two bath house and you're getting a con, you're getting a, a, um, a duplex, if you're getting a duplex with two, three bed, two bath units, or even three bed, one bath units, if you're getting that, the rent on that house, it might be 3000 bucks, but the rent on your half of the duplex is probably 25 or 26. So it might be a 10, maybe 12, maybe 15% hit but you're only paying 30% more guys. The math is there. It's crazy. And you also diversified because now if one tenant goes sideways, 
you're probably still making your mortgage or close to it. You might be a few hundred bucks in a hole as opposed to basically, if you look at the single family homes, husband and wife, both working, they both had to apply and you counted on both their income. Well, when one of them loses their income, are they still, do they still qualify for the unit? Largely speaking, they don't. So now you're basically, you're on notice that soon they're going to stop paying their rent unless that husband or wife can find another job. This is why I've always loved duplexes. You can buy them with the same exact debt. You can buy a single family home. You can house hack it. But more importantly, it's the value. It's the premium that you get for a home that you don't necessarily recognize the premium in rents. Like I said, I can find a three bed, two bath home. It's for rent for 3000 or 3200 A three bed, two bath side of a condo or side of a duplex that's actually renting for, like I said, 25, 26, 27. No brainer. It's just math. So yes, diversification within your portfolio, different assets, different areas, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Dion, I think takes it to the extreme of, you know, things being, you know, half hour to an hour apart. Don't love that. I don't want to jump in the car and drive an hour to anything when I'm self-managing. I also don't want to have to have such a big network that they have to drive out that far to all those things. From the closest point to the furthest point in our portfolio, you can get there in 25 minutes. So even if you had an emergency over in side A, get all the way to Z, 25 minutes apart. Because what you do is I diversify within the tenant base. So he diversifies based on, hey, there's a Boeing, there's an Amazon, there's a Starbucks, there's tech, there's all of these things, right? I diversify based on the tenant base. So I'll have section eight, I'll have, but within my market, I'll have students, I'll have young professionals, I'll have retirees, I will have, you know, your, your typical uh, pre-house unit, which is, I know that the next thing that they're buying is a house. So it was funny. One of them, one, two couples came in the same time. One of them was buying a house within 18 months. Um, they literally told me after the one year lease, they said, Hey, we don't want to buy anything in the winter time. We're kind of looking more for summer. Um, uh, and so can we just do a six month lease instead? And I said, Nope, no need. Don't worry about it. You find the right thing, go because I didn't want it to become a fight and it didn't need to be. So sure enough, and within 18 months, like sometime around like July or August, they were moving and they treated the unit fantastically well. And so we had a new renter in there that following month. It was really straightforward, really easy. The other couple that was planning on buying a house, they've been there seven years. Maybe they've had a lot of life happen. Don't know. But they've been there for seven years. And so the interesting thing is, and having been there for seven years, they've paid a lot of money, a lot of money in rent. I mean, they've paid 150, 160 grand already in rent is what they paid living there. And now, now the rents are more expensive than the mortgage for the house. They would need to move a little bit, probably a little bit further north, but still, you know, still, still good. So Key, good morning, sir. Good to have you here. Early morning for Key. Actually, probably not an early morning for Key. Um, Robert Fanelli. Yeah, my insurance companies are also doing more exterior surveys. Oh yeah. Any idea what they are looking for? Hopefully they don't randomly decide to replace the roof. That's what they're looking at. They're looking at roof health. They're looking at chimney health for us in the Northeast. That's a big thing is looking at chimneys. Um, what else are they looking for? They're looking for deterioration is really what they're looking for. Like rot, rot around windows, um, uh, you know, disrepair is usually what they're looking for. Yep. So when they're doing stuff externally, it's, it's more of a review than it is like a true inspection, you know, like no one's climbing up on your roof and that sort of thing, unless they maybe see a problem, then they're going to go further investigate it, but then they have to get your permission to do that. Uh, good morning. I have two, Julie Anderson. Good morning. I have two properties at 7%. At what interest rate do I refi at? That is a fantastic question, Julie. So the couple ways that I look at this are, um, if the rate is seven, but you've had the mortgage for 12 to 15 years and your strategy is paying things off. I don't believe it or not. I don't refi. If it's been at seven for a while, um, I would be warming things up. I'd be talking to some, you know, to some mortgage brokers. Usually the, usually the right payoff is, is a 1% decline. If you want to start over again, um, 
you know, no one knows what the future is. No one knows what rates are going to be. So it really depends on who you listen to. I listen to uneducated economists. I listen to Simon a lot. I watch a lot of his stuff, participate in a lot of live streams, member of his channel, big fan, big, big fan of Simon's. And I agree with him. I think we're higher for longer. I mean, look at the numbers. Look at the, look at the financial numbers that just came out. Like less unemployment than they expected, more jobs than they expected. Like can't make this stuff up. So it just moves slowly. That's the one thing you constantly have to tell yourself is it moves slowly. It moves slowly. It moves slowly. Even the massive interest rate move that we had from, you know, three and a half to seven or seven and a half, that still took like eight or nine months. Like that's still technically kind of slow seeing as how I can go in my fridge and get a drink right now. You know, so that's kind of the way that I look at it. So to answer your question, it's usually if it's a point or less, what I would be doing now is I would be shopping because there might be the opportunity to, you know, buy rate down on a refi as well. Um, and also the other thing to keep in mind is right now your values are high too. The challenge of refinancing and timing refinancing is that a lot of times when people go to try and refinance, they don't have enough equity in the property. And so they can't refinance out. So then it doesn't matter if you were seven or six. So the question is at five or five and a half has enough damage to the, to the country and to, to values has enough damage at that point been done to where now you're not going to have your 20 or 25% equity and the banks start to tighten. So when I was doing deals with banks a year and a half ago, it was 20% loan to, or 80% loan to value, 20% equity. Then it went to 75% um, loan to value. Then it went to 70. And now there are some banks that are struggling a little bit that are 55, 60, 65. Well, how much risk do they have if they're only underwriting about half the value of the property? Because they're still going to appraise it. And they're like, well, we'll give you a 60%. So six out of $10 you're going to give me. And so I have a bunch of debt equity there. And then what happens? Then you don't have enough of an equity position to be able to refi out. So that's the challenging part. Usually it's that one, it's that drop of 1% in a rate, but I would be also keeping an eye on values. Again, you guys know, I believe that by the end of this year, I think we're going to see some correction in median home prices. And actually we already have. So if you look at the data that actually came out um, for Q3, it came, I, I believe in November, but if you look up Fred, F-R-E-D, median existing home sales, median or median existing home sales price, you will see it's actually down like 4.9%. Now, what is that from? It's kind of a tricky metric. It's a tricky metric because it's not an average. And what it really means is that when 10 transactions happen, that the median, the middle one has come down 4.9%. But what does that really mean? What I believe it really means is that the upper transactions are largely disappearing. The move up buyers are largely disappearing. And so then you get a concentration of if it were a third, a third, and a third, well, this market's almost gone. This market's almost gone. And so then your focus comes here. So I'm not talking about a crash where it goes down over 20%. What I'm talking about is that correction because with the top part of the market missing and when the stock market starts going down, that's what feeds into it. I thought the market would stay in that corrective phase like it did in the beginning of the year where it was around 20, 25% down. I thought it would stay there. It didn't. It didn't because why? There was so much cash on the streets. So because the market didn't stay down, because the market rallied and now is back next to an, uh, an almost at an all-time high, what will happen with the market the next year? So I believe that there's some nervousness, obviously. I believe that we're seeing still that large part of the market, all the big transactions, the big, big ones for single family are down. So I believe existing home sales, median existing home sales, I believe I'm going to hit my 10% number. And I think it will be the numbers that get reported, not in Q4, potentially, maybe, I hope, that would take off, uh, take off the grind, but January, February, March, now we're going to see a little bit of a bump because rates dropped a little bit. So that's where it's like always trying to throw darts at the dartboard. That's why time in the market is better than time in the market. Uh, Dion talk financial freedom. Every time you hit the like button and a crash bro cries. Ooh, I gotta hit the like button. It's very appealing. I love it. Um, 
Wealth Building Journey. Sorry for your loss, Laura. That's right. We are a community here together. We root for each other. Um, All Nighter Hider. That's the ultimate move up by a receiver, Chester. Yep. Sorry for your loss. Good for her. She's surrounded on, on, by only bliss now. That is very true. If you know anything about heaven, that's the truth. Um, let's see. Kyle Dorn. In my market, uh, roofs are number one concern with insurance inspection. Anything older than 15 years, they will not. They will want replaced or they drop coverage. So what you need to be doing is you need to be having a conversation with a bunch of insurance agents now. Okay. The reason why is, is that insurance likes to make rules up like most industries like to make rules up as they go along. When an industry like insurance makes rules up as they go along and they start saying, well, if the year, if the roof is 15 years old, you know, uh, you're going to need to replace it. I beg to differ. Why do I beg to differ? Because I have a ton of roofs that I didn't replace for 30, 35, 40 years. And when I replace them, I replace them with a 30 to 40 year equivalent. So you use architectural shingles. You'll use a ridge cap so it's properly vented. You'll make sure that you'll do proper venting on the gable ends or soffits, whatever your choice is. You'll make sure that you're doing, um, you know, when you're doing the architectural shingles that are actually rated for 30 years. Guys, this is important. So what I would be doing is, is I would be calling insurance people, insurance agencies and companies directly and I would be saying to them, I put a 30-year roof on where there is a 30-year roof on this building. It's not failing. It's in great shape. I want to understand what your inspection stance is on a 30-year architectural shingled roof. And if you have one where you don't have the original receipt because you didn't do it or you bought it from somebody who didn't do it, all you need to do is pay a roofer to come out and say, one that you trust, obviously. Pay a roofer to come out and say, yeah, I mean, it looks like these shingles were installed. A lot of times shingles are dated on the backside or on a tacking strip. So you can actually see the date on some of that stuff. The other thing that you can do too is, is that you can have a roofer come out and look at it and say, you know what? It appears as though the age of this roof is approximately 10 years old. It is in my opinion that I believe based on the install and the quality of product that was used, that you should be able to reach the life expectancy of this roof of 30 to 35 years. This is a way that we can combat the insurance companies to make sure that they know and that they know that we're educated consumers. And you can't just say, well, it's 15 years old. It probably needs replacing. Prove it. It's not leaking. It's got newer technology on the roof. I'm not going to replace it for nothing. And that way, if they try and drop you, you'll know in advance, are they going to be that kind of company? Because you don't want to get dropped and then have to shop because they'll ask you, is there current insurance on the building? You don't want to have to say no. So if we're in a fight with an insurance company and they're arguing back and forth, what do I do? I haven't been dropped. I go and I get insurance somewhere else because I'm not going to listen to their noise. You know, they want to change the game. They want to change rules. I bought a 30 year architectural shingled roof and I had it installed properly to code and to spec spec, meaning these are the specifications that the company has put forward and said, when you install it this way, that's the important right? So when you're doing it that way, it's of critical importance that you get that documented because when you send that documentation to the insurance company, they can still say, yeah, we're not going to do it. Or that's still what your rate is. And you say, okay, that's fine. And then you just go shopping. You're better positioned to go shopping. Now you're better positioned. If you know that they're going to flag you for a 15 year roof, you're better positioned to go and do it now and try and get in front of people. But that's just my thought on the matter. Um, let's see. Good morning from Washington. Good morning, Flavio G waters. Good morning, Luke divine. Happy Sunday lover. What is your go-to property rent collection that you use door loop logics or something else? Great question. Luke, Luke, you are just bringing the fire. I'm telling you, you've had weeks after weeks of good questions. Whew. Always put me on my heels in a good way. Um, so we use a combination. We use Venmo, uh, PayPal, um, door loop, check, cash and money order. Not preferred, right? But we have some retirees. They don't want to use door loop. They don't. They don't want to use tech. They don't use their phones. So checks. Um, cash. We have waitresses that get a ton of money in cash. Um, or, uh, you know, what else is, what else is cash? Uh, 
laborers, same thing. So we will take cash and just send them an, uh, a text with a receipt. Um, money orders, people that can't get a checking account because they burned all the banks locally. Uh, we've seen that happen uh, or they couldn't get a bank account uh, for whatever reason. And so money orders, we do very, I think we do maybe two or three people that do money orders. It's not a lot. Um, and then door loop, a majority of people are in door loop. Yeah, we're going to be, I'm going to be launching a part of the course that's going to be how to fully automate your property management. News, you just heard the news. Fully automated property management. It shows people how to log a ticket. It shows people how to set up their account. It shows them how to set up auto debit for, for rent. Literally, it's all there. All there. Super easy, lemon squeezy, spend a whole lot less time managing your properties. Monica Galdemez. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Any recommendations on how to find deals? All the deals that real estate agents send me or the numbers are off. Yeah. I check the market daily. I can't find anything that cash flow. Absolutely, Monica. Okay. So here's my top three tips for getting a deal even in this market. Number one, you should absolutely be doing what Robert Farinelli talked about earlier in the stream where he said, I'm going to look up stuff that's expired and I'm going to contact the sellers. Seller probably still wants to sell and you just got a 6% discount because they just made 6% more money by letting you buy it. And it also opens the door for seller financing. Second best option for actually finding deals is you got to get to the landlord meetups. You got to get to some sort of a group, some sort of a meetup, and then you post something. I saw something awesome this last week from an agent. She posted on Facebook, I have four clients looking for homes. Here's what they're looking for and here's the price range. I have a house that I would consider selling in that price range. She's supposed to come look at it sometime next week. Maybe it's a fit, maybe it's not, but guess what? She created an opportunity for a buy and she created an opportunity for me for a sell. So you should absolutely be telling the market, not just the universe, the market, what exactly it is that you're looking for. So get into local landlord groups, search those out. You got to find what those are. You got to, you got to, you got to. And if you do, and if you do, that is a fantastic way to create your next deal. Lastly, this is the most valuable way to find a deal, but no one ever does it. They're lazy. Not saying that you're lazy, Monica, because I know you're going to do these three things and then you're going to be talking about in three weeks how you got something under contract. Look at your city code enforcement office. They likely have a letter that gets sent out monthly. That monthly letter actually shows all the violations that they've hit landlords with or owners of properties with. You need to be looking at that list and you need to be targeting that list. Yep. Why? Because they're getting violations. Are they an out-of-state landlord? That's the next thing that I'm looking at. Are they out-of-state? Are they local? Look at these things and you will find unbelievable value. I've found properties this way that were just in horrible disrepair. I actually called Coast and Code Enforcement and said, I'm trying to buy this. Tell me all I need to know. They're like, ooh, Matt, that one's brutal. Cool. Awesome. Awesome. I'm not going to take the seller's word for it that eh, it's not that bad. I want to hear from the code enforcement officer. How bad is it? Matt, it's so unbelievably bad. Inside stinks. Like you're going to have to, you know, knock it down. You rarely have to knock it down. It's usually just an extensive, uh, extensive work. So those are the top three ways that I would actually look to find deals in a difficult market. You're not going to find it on MLS. You're largely not going to find it with some agent. You're going to have to create your own destiny and create your own opportunity. And again, calling the sellers on stuff that has expired and that is no longer on the market that looks like it might be what you want to buy. Fantastic way of doing that. The last one that I mentioned, I still is my favorite, which is looking at the code enforcement list. And as you're looking at that code enforcement list, talking to those, talking to those owners whether it's a landlord or a homeowner, a lot of times it can be uh, an, an elderly person that just says, I can't keep up with the property anymore. You know, uh, all my friends have moved away. Uh, you know what? Now is probably the right time to sell. We've done a few of those where we've had that conversation with people. 
you know, and it's worked out, you know, really pretty well. And then the second one, like I've talked about is in the landlord groups, talking to people, what do we know that they're doing if they're in a landlord group? They're a landlord, they have properties. So the idea and the most critical thing is to find those types of opportunities because when you do find those types of opportunities, they're likely something that somebody would be interested in at least having the conversation. And you'll have to show them your math. You know, hey, this is what I believe it's worth. It's always going to be less than what they thought. Almost always, not always, but almost always. And that's what usually will work for you. So those top three ways are a way that you're insured to find a deal sometime this year and not have to rely on MLS. Um, let's see, Kyle Dorn got a couple questions for a new rental of mine. Have someone that makes three X the rent, but bank statements from November to January show overdraft twice with a balance of $286. No financial stability. I say deny three X the rent is good. What's their credit? Because if they have three X the rent of income and their credit is garbage, well then that 286 makes a big difference. I don't like pe people that close to the edge anyway but it's at least wor worth taking a look at. Kyle Dorn, your thoughts. She pays mom $900 rent, bank statement, don't show it. Yeah, I pay my mom $3.7 million last year in rent. Nah, nope, 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 nope. God can pay with a check, all others pay cash. So no, I don't believe that, not for one second. You also have to watch for, I won't do a video on this because it's just, it's too much, but I, for one of the first times I'd gotten fake, uh, pay, fake pay stubs, fake pay stubs. And it was a juvenile attempt. I was like, there's no taxes taken out. Like it just shows you an end number faker than fake, 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 any fake. Yeah. So you got to watch out for that now too. Um, <clears throat> Let's see. Luke Devine. Good to see you from Christian's uh, steam earlier this week, Hyder. Yes, exactly. Good stuff. Um, All Nighter. You've chosen some great channels uh, to Luke. Uh, you've chosen some great channels uh, to follow. This knowledge uh, with your ambition tells me you're going places. Yeah, there's no doubt in my mind Luke is going to be just fine. Yeah, Luke will be just fine. Monica, I only have single family homes. What's the best way to transition in this market? So it's really talking to uh, those other landlords, you know, understanding you have to do, you know, if you're from uh, the Zuber uh, one rental at a time crew, you want to do a buy box. Um, if you are, uh, that, that's a good way to eval evaluate it, but you start to look at single family homes is a different market than twos, threes, and fours. And that's a different market than five through tens. And that's a different market from the 45 unit stuff. Um, and so the best way to do this is to look at a different asset class and start educating yourself on it. That's what I did. I didn't want to get in the commercial. No interest. I actually, my first commercial deal, I bought it because it was mixed use. Commercial on the first floor, residential on the second floor. The I bought the building so right that the residential rent on the second floor covered the mortgage and all my profit. So the commercial space was just a layup. It was like, well, that's a no brainer, right? So I did it. And now big surprise, the commercial space rents for a lot more than what the residential space does. Why does that matter? Because the residential space still covers my nut, still covers all my costs. So that commercial space is pure profit and it's more that profit, the, the profit on that building is more than what the, what the uh, second floor rent is, the profit on that building, pure profit. Uh, Michael Diaz. Good morning. Good to have you here, Michael. Um, Angel R. Matt, after retirement, will you pay off your properties? No. Nope. I won't. I will not pay off anything that has three or three and a half or four percent debt. Will we get back there? Maybe. But the, the thing that so many people miss is that if rates get back down there, something bad happened in the economy. If something bad happened in the economy, the value of your asset is now less. Can you even refi it? Right? And so for me, I want to continue to pay down. I want, as you go in that 30 year fixed rate debt journey, every year you're paying more and more and more against the principal. So that's why for me to go from a seven rate to a five rate, but I'm 15 years in on the mortgage. Nah, I want to keep on paying down that mortgage. And then when it's finally paid off in 15 years, I'm probably going to layer it with a ton of debt. 
or maybe I sell it at that point. Don't know. We have uh, my very first or one of my very first assets. I'm actually going to be paying off in 2024. And it's not because I'm accelerating the pay schedule. It's only because I, I accelerated it because when I was paying it down, it was one of the, one of the deals that I got and it had like 8% debt on it. So I didn't bother refinancing it. Um, you know, even in a few, for a few years of low rates, didn't want to bother with it. Didn't want my credit getting hit for it. Um, and so now what I'm going to do is it'll pay off this year. And so when I sell that, I'm either going to take the gain, you know, long-term capital gain on that property or I'll 1031 in. And so that will be the first example I have of paying off or selling a paid off property or what I did with a paid off property. Uh, so great question, Angel. Um, Tamika, uh, question. Okay. Let me just roll. There we go. All right. Um, we're rolling with, we're rolling with Tamika. Um, inherited tenant on a month to month lease. I'm going through it with an inherited tenant right now, Tamika. Honest to good. Uh, rent is 2,100 bucks. Tenant made partial payment before the first of 1700 remaining rent and late fee now due. Do you immediately move to cure or vacate notice? So the challenge that you have is that if you accepted partial payment, that essentially means that you're working things out with them. So depending on what your state law is, you need to check that. But once we, if we've posted papers, because here's the thing, they came up with some money, right? If you post papers and then they come up with money and you accept that money with, in our state, we actually have to say, thank you for paying us this amount of money towards the back rent. This by no means way, shape or form affects the current eviction order in process. That's what we can leave them with. That way, when we get in front of the judge, we say, we let them know with a disclaimer when they gave us the money that it wasn't going to affect the eviction. Unless, of course, they then all of a sudden get caught up. I've seen people where they were like, they pushed the envelope, they pushed the envelope, they got in front of a judge and or two days before they got in front of the judge or they got in front of the judge and then said, Your Honor, we want to work something out. And so then they tried to work something out because now you have an agreement. Well, when you don't follow through the agreement, then you can get kicked out or you can basically then you have to go back to the court and say, hey, this tenant didn't comply with the agreement that we had in place we want this taken care of, right? So that then puts you in a position where now you can't evict them unless you go now through the process of the, of the courts of non-compliance, the judge looking at it, seeing that they didn't comply with the order that they agreed to. And then the judge can basically give you a, uh, give them a notice to vacate. And then that actually, then you pick that up, bring it to the sheriff's office, they serve, and then they do a door lock and then they have seven days to get their stuff. And you have to make it commercially or reasonably available for them to get their stuff. And then, you know, then they're gone. Um, so the issue always is, is with partial payment, it typically starts the clock over again. Just check on your state rules and laws and make sure that that applies to you. Um, Julie Anderson, five years, I'm thinking five or four. Yeah. I mean, I think, I, I mean, again, I think that it's that one, you know, if you get that 1% reduction rate, the issue is, is that if the economy does soften and does get worse and does get bad, you know, second half of this year, and we do actually go into a recession, well, the banks are going to compress the margin, meaning they're not going to be 300 basis points over their cost of lending. They're going to, they're going to shrink that number. The Fed's going to go down with their number um, if they see recession. <clears throat> and then I believe that that then leads to lower rates. I just think that they're going to hold the rate higher for longer. So I think these people that think they're going to be six rate cuts this year, I will bet you. It's not going to be six rate cuts. No way. No way. That will make inflation scream back. Um, All Night Rider. Simon is a man of great character and has a way of interpreting, explaining things for us to then form our own opinions. Kind of like Matt. Thanks, Hyder. I appreciate that. Best compliment I could ever get. Yeah, Simon's fantastic. He's a real dude, goes to work every single day, just like most of us. And, uh, and sees a part of the world that does impact us, you know, lumber and supply chain. He sees that stuff, you know, as a rehabber, um, you know, we spent over a million dollars last year, rehabbing properties over a million bucks. I think it's pretty close. So what I would encourage you guys to do is watching Simon, uh, uneducated economist. You can't help, but learn. You really, you just can't help, but learn. Landlord Odyssey. What's happening, everybody? What's up, Brady? Good to have you. 
Can't wait to see the jail progression videos. Some on sites would be awesome. I'm still going through. So when I bought the property from the city, they said I didn't need to do a site review. So we went in and did our application for permit. This was six weeks ago. And we did this six weeks ago, got our application for permit. Um, and then they were like, oh, there's no site review on record. Right. You said we didn't need to do a site review. Yeah. So we're going to need a site review. My attorney's like, we have it in email from you saying that there's no site review needed. They're like, yeah, there's going to need to be a site review. Needed. Golden rule. I couldn't do anything about it. That's why I'm 5,000 bucks, almost 6,000 bucks into a site review. Not too happy about it in all honesty. So we had to do a site review. Kind of sucks. Cost me 5,000 bucks, cost me another 3,000 or 4,000 attorney's fees. So it cost me eight or nine grand to have to do a stupid site review. And we're not even changing anything to the outside of the building, which really kind of bothers me, but you got to play by the rules that they make up as they go along. Um, and so the downside to that is that I still don't have a bowling permit, so I can't technically do anything. So we presented last month, my attorney and I presented last month. Um, and so everything, all the variances, all the CUPs, which called what stands for a change in use permit that actually all that stuff changed <clears throat> and got approved. And so they have like four or five stipulations that we have to go through now. But when we present on those this month, then we should be good to go. Everything's all set and there's nothing left for us to do. And we can actually then go in and get a building permit because site review will have been completed. Yeah. Um, all night hider, Fred, federal reserve education department. Yes. Sounds like an oxymoron, eh? Uh, insurance companies say no. I say next millennial Mike, true story, right? If they're like, well, you know, listen, it's only going to get worse. You don't need to fight them. There's plenty of them out there. You know, <clears throat> one of the insurance companies gave us a quote for $8,000 on a property. And my broker's just like, I don't know what you want me to do. I shopped it. That's the best we're getting. I was like, okay. Called State Farm. <laughs> Not joking. Called State Farm. 3600 bucks. I sent him the quote. He goes, what the hell is that? And I go, that's my insurance. You're not getting this one. He's like, that's insane. I don't know what to tell you. I don't know whatever actuarial is using the calculator on that side and playing with the tables, but here's what I can tell you. Number is what the number is, and it's less than half what you quoted me. Don't worry. I don't hate you yet, but if I find that this becomes a trend, you will be replaced. Sean Connolly, I inherited a tenant on month to month lease with no security deposit. Just got them on a new lease starting in February with a security deposit. Cool. Do I take pictures of the unit in its current condition? Yes, absolutely you do. Sean, I love that you asked that question. Absolutely, 1000%, you need pictures of it as it sits right now. And you justify that to the tenant and you say flat out, I got to take pictures of the way it is right now today because any previous damage, you're not on the hook for. Because unless you have pictures from the old landlord, you're they're not on the hook for it. So I would absolutely take pictures right now as of today. The best way to do that is you actually take a newspaper from that day. You take a picture of the front of it. And then you just basically take all your other pictures. That's the best way to do it. People are like, oh, well, you can change the date on the camera. Yeah, you can. Yep. So I take a picture of a newspaper with it leaning in the apartment. That's the best way to do it. And then I also will do like a quick walkthrough of it as well um, on a video. So I do both. Or I have people do both now. We used to do them physically. Uh, Julie Anderson, my car insurance just increased 25%. I think it's all going to jump. It is. It's all going to jump. Absolutely. It's going to jump. Yep. Uh, Kyle Dorn, Sean, do your inspection pictures right now. Totally agree. Excellent advice, Kyle. Michael Diaz, what are the pros and cons to rent to corporate? Seems like they're going to sublease. Uh, no, not really. Um, all of the corporate agreements that I've worked with in the past, um, they don't sublease. What they do is, is that they go under lease for the property as the, as the lease le uh, lessee of the property because the people that they're doing in corporate work for corporate. So what that's good is, is it actually holds corporate, you know, corporate accountable. 
Um, but what you do is you just document it because corporations largely, yeah, they got attorneys and they got attorneys that already work there. And so it doesn't cost them anything to drop it on, you know, Tim's desk. Sorry, Tim, you're the attorney today. Um, but yes, I absolutely do a corporate lease, making sure that there's pictures in there. That way, this is the way it is because guess what they're not going to do? If it's 1800, 2,500 bucks in damage on the unit when they leave, I've had that happen. I rented out to corporate and that's what the way it was. I had pictures before, I had pictures after, and I just said, this is what it was before. This is what it was after you guys left. And they're like, oh, crap. Yeah, crap. Um, not only that, but then they're also responsible for the utilities. That's Well, that's what I make sure happens. So that's um, so they don't actually sublease. In fact, in H-1B visas, where they actually bring in, um, here's here's a learning moment. So a number of organizations will actually bring in people from other countries, H-1B visas. And so that basically says that they're here for a term and they're only here to do this job. And if they lose that job, they then have to go home. It's usually termed as well, where it might be for like, I think it's a nine month stay if I'm not mistaken, but then they get sent home and then they can come back in the next year, provided they didn't have any lease, any, any, not lease violations, but provided they didn't have any violations, um, you know, like criminal type of things. So what's really cool about that is that companies that use the and do the H-1B process, what's really cool about that H-1B process is that they fill out all the paperwork, they get allocated those workers by the government. But what they have to show is that they have living conditions that are acceptable and that they're provided. So that way they don't want people from these other countries having to come in and sign up for an electric account, sign up for a gas account, sign up for a lawn care account. So that's actually on, they actually put that on the person that's sponsoring the H-1B visa. And so it then isn't a sublease at all. When I have a problem with one of those tenants, I don't call the tenant. I call the corporation. I call their uh, uh, project manager or I call their, uh, uh, what do they call that? I call their team leader. I'll call their team leader and say, Hey, we're having a little bit of an issue over here. Here are the issues. He says, I will talk to them. Sorry about that. I'll get back to you if I have any other additional questions. That's how it goes. So not sublease, but good question. Um, all night or hider. Insurance companies rely on fractional claims, much like fractional reserves. Yes, they have every incentive to deny a claim. Let's hold them accountable to their decisions. Thousand percent. Absolutely 1000%. In fact, when I've gotten on the phone with insurance companies, I've said to them, the thing that you've gotten out of me is about a million dollars, million bucks or more actually now, but over a million dollars of premiums. That's what you've gotten out of me. What have I gotten out of you? Inspections. I've not ever filed a claim in these last 10 years. And so, or 15 years. So yeah, you've cost me an absolute fortune and you've done nothing for me. And then one time when we had a conversation, they're like, well, and I was like, nope, forget it. I'm not going to do it because I already know you're going to jack my rates on everything. And I'm just going to take the 10K hit and just do it myself. Not going to, not going to put it through insurance. Ninja Vanish 24 seven. Good morning, Rob checking from Rio, which is where apparently is where my family goes when we want to get the flu. Rob, sorry to hear about that, my man. That sucks. Uh, Flavio, I never thought that way. My tenant work for code enforcement on my town. Thanks a lot. You're very, very welcome. Always here to provide value folks. Don church. Thanks for everything, Matt. Borrowing your butcher block counter and tin backsplash so far. Polly looks amazing. I hate to let anyone use it. I know. Right. So the way that you get around the poly thing, Don, is if you use actual FDA grade epoxy, that stuff is way more resilient than poly, just so you know. And it looks even better, just as an FYI. Kyle Dorn, credit score, 600. Nope, which is my minimum requirement. Oof, I'd raise that. Employment income verified, but bank statements scare me that she has been has a spending problem. Don't disagree. Yeah, I don't love the, I don't love the 600 credit, but I mean, if it hits all your criteria... Like I said, that's scary. That's scary. Find a way to do the math. Find a way to do the math where you can back into the 900 actually being paid. Right? So if you, because that's such a massive number. So if you look at her income and then you look at, at two bank statements, look at all of her bank statements for a month, 
then add another 900 bucks taking out of that. You should see something. You should see a check for 900. Um, you should see a, um, a withdrawal for 900. You should see something for 900 bucks. You should see it there. Even if it's cash that she got, like you should still see it there. Cause she had to take, it had to, from her job, from her paycheck, it had to have gotten in the account somehow, unless maybe, I mean, unless she's a waitress, maybe, but yeah, dude. Um, you know, if I were to, if in my shoes, she would get denied based on uh credit score in my shoes, I would also deny her based on unverifiable income or unverifiable expenses. And she would say, well, what does that mean? Say, I can't verify your rent unverifiable and it changes the numbers so greatly that you then don't financially qualify and look at it too. Look at her three times the rent number. Make sure that it's three times net, not three times gross. We just had somebody do that to uh, last this last weekend. That was a, uh, that is a uh, self-employed and they were like, Oh yeah, but I make three times the rent. I said, gross. They're like, well, I actually make four times the rent. I said, gross. So like, what does that mean? Keep on saying that. And I was like, you're self-employed. You owe 15% of FICA, bro. 15% plus federal. Plus federal. Mm-mm. Mm-mm. Don't qualify. Mm-mm. Nope. Um, Rob, at least I paid for the hotel with reward points and not cash. See, that's a good thing. Glass is always half full. I agree with Heider. Robert Fernelli. Um, I am an asshole with rent now. I just posted papers, been burnt too many times, even if they give a partial payment. Totally agree. Post away, kids. Listen, it's the only way to get them to pay attention. It's what you have to do. It's what you have to do. You must, 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 must do it that way. You must. You must do it that way. It is of critical importance. I'm trying to see if I got my latest... Oh, where's it? Hold on one second. Hmm. There we go. One second. I know this is great television, right? And people say I'm a YouTuber, not a YouTuber. Business guy who does YouTube. Come on. I know horrible television. I get it. I get it. Yeah, so true. All right. Sorry. Back to the show. Um, Angel R, Matt, how do you manage outdoor hose bibs in cold climates to prevent pipes burst? Do you remove them or switch to an ACOR system? I actually shut them. So I will uh, shut them off from the inside, but my shutoffs are much further inside. Like they're a couple feet inside. And then I just open up the, I open it up and I let it all drain out. So it's literally wide open. Wide open, shut it, and that's it. Because then it's just a metal pipe in the wintertime. The key is if the shutoff is like right next to the sill, we'll forget it. Like, that's not going to work. Um, but then the other thing too is, is that on those areas, I'll make sure that I'll like grate stuff or spray some foam in that area. That's of critical importance too. Yep. So that's how that's how I deal with it. Anna K. Hey, how are you, Anna K? Good morning. Um, should I ask insurance to increase a rebuild value to market value? Um, new acquisitions are covered up to the purchase price for rebuild, 
value. Yep, but old purchase rebuild value is far below what it's worth. Yes, um, you you can um, you can. I, I would get a quote on it. I would get a quote on it and just see what it's worth to you. That's what I would do. I would get a quote on it and see what it's worth to you. That's the that's a swan type of question, right? I want to sleep better at night. I want to make sure I'm 100% covered. Well, here's how you do that. You actually get the replacement value. Um, and if you then actually get that replacement value, then there's nothing to worry about. Um, what I can tell you is, is that that is a fight as well. Um, I had a, a friend of mine had a boat, um, got uh, a very nice boat, very nice boat. Not a boat guy. Had had some. Don't have any now. Um, his boat was in the storm uh, back in Florida, whatever it was, a year and a half ago. It caused they got, he got a quote. His boat was worth. I can't believe boats are worth this. His boat was worth one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. One hundred and fifty thousand dollar boat. Oh my heavens! One hundred and fifty thousand dollar boat. Yeah, not my not my take. So 150 grand on the boat. They quote 100 and it was either 110 or 120 thousand bucks to fix it. Yep. So it wasn't bad enough to be totaled. Well, then he starts going down the path. And then what does everybody down there start doing? They start jacking up the prices that they're charging to get this type of boat work done. So now he not only is not going to have a boat for a year, he's not going to have a boat for two years. Worse yet is they came back with an amended proposal after they really reviewed it and it was $175,000, which then totaled the boat. And so what he said was, I want a boat. And so he had to fight with the insurance company about saying the 110 is gone. It's now 175 and I'm not paying $65,000 more than what you paid or more than what the payout was. So he had to get involved, fight with an insurance company. They did end up doing the payout because, and for him, he didn't lose two seasons of no boat. And who would really want to have a boat back that had like 80% of it totaled? Like not for me. So yes, I would always ask the insurance company for a quote on that. And then you make the decision of what it's worth. Alyssa M, to what do we owe the pleasure, Alyssa M? So good to have you here. Alyssa M was one of my very first interviews on my channel. She's absolutely fantastic. She owns in three states, Montana, or three buildings, Montana and Utah are states. Um, they are states. Um, but yeah, she's absolutely awesome. Uh, Tamika L. Uh, Robert Farinelli agreed. Since they're month to month, I plan to give notice. Yep, I don't deal well with late payers. Nor should we. Because heaven knows if anything needs to be taken care of or fixed, they're not tolerant. And they want it fixed yesterday. Like I just had some jerk tenant. And yeah, I'm using the word jerk. We, there was a roof leak. We went through three roofers. We finally got one of our roofers to show up and fix it. Took a couple of weeks, but it doesn't rain every day here. It's not Seattle. So he fixed it. She was like, yeah, but none of the other work has been done. Hey, dopey. I'm not going to do the other work in the attic when it still leaks. Does that make sense? Like, don't be rude. She was rude about the fact that it hadn't been done. Well, did you have a half a brain cell to figure out why it wasn't done? When we had told her, as soon as the roof is fixed, we're going to take care of the inside stuff. Now, the inside stuff was about was about a half a day's worth of work, maybe a little bit more. But it's all it was all repaired. And it was repaired within three days of the roof being done, which was, by the way, Christmas week, the week after Christmas and New Year and between New Year's. So it was all done last week. Then the inspector actually complained about paint. He's like, well, there's chipping paint here. Yeah, I didn't live there. I didn't chip it. When she moved in, the place was all brand new painted. She chipped it. So my guy went back and he's like, I'm not painting all of this. And so he did touch-ups. It was on stairs, on stairs going up to her unit in a hallway. And she complained that they were only spot touched. I mean, they have treads on there. Like that's going to be a big, huge, massive job. And we cured what housing deemed an issue. And so would I like to redo all of the stairs? I don't think it's necessary. They're stairs. It's wintertime. Why would I want to do that? Certainly if I'm going to do it, why would I want to do it in January? You know, and you're then going to complain about the fact that you can't use the stairs all day long because they're going to be getting painted. It's always something sometimes. Uh, let's see. 
all night or higher. Anna, simply asking for their accounting and yep, and how they made the decision may may soften them up to your request. Yep. Uh, it may not too, but I think it's worth an email to try. You don't know if you don't ask. Well, you can ask them. They're, they will often, depending on who your rep is, they'll quote it um, the different ways. So often a really seasoned rep will tell you, do you want an as is? Do you want an uh, um, uh, an as built? Do you want replacement? What do you want for coverage? They'll ask you those questions and then you get to decide. Other people just arbitrarily pick the one that's cheapest because they don't want to hear the argument about why insurance is so expensive. So you can always get them to quote it. It costs you nothing. But yeah, that's a simple email. Pretty easy. Um, let's see, Monica Galdemez. I have two jobs, five rental properties that I manage, two children under six and learning about how to continue investing. I am tired, but seeing you guys going and doing this makes me push myself daily. Thank you. You're welcome. Monica, my mom was a single mom. My mom was a single mom. She had my, myself still in the house. She had me at, uh, seven, my sister at five. Um, and she was a single mom. She was a real estate agent. So it was, you know, peaks and valleys of the market and, and commissions and things like that. You're doing an amazing job. Absolutely amazing job. Two kids, six and under holding down your jobs, still investing. You're doing an amazing, amazing job. So well done. Good for you. You're inspiring to me because I don't have nearly that going on. So you're inspiring to me. Um, Rob quote for the shirt. You got to play by the rules. The city makes up as they go along. <laughs> yeah. True story. I know. I don't want to say things like that, but that one was ultra frustrating and $8,000 to the point. It was so frustrating. So yeah, sadly SK morning, Matt. Good morning, SK. Good to see you. Uh, what's been your major source of rental interest when listing properties for rent Zillow, Facebook marketplace. I see a lot of noise. In Facebook Marketplace, Zillow is quality, but much less, or but less volume. Sorry, you didn't want to put words in your mouth. Um, we see, um, we just see a lot. We see a lot of almost all of our volume is Facebook Marketplace. Almost all of it. Yeah. It's free. It's where a lot of people go. Um, Facebook Marketplace. Yep. Yep. We still do Craigslist because we still see stuff um, from Craigslist. We still see renters. So, I'd like to see how much of business um, Facebook marketplace took away from Craigslist when they started doing all that, because we, five years ago, six years ago, we were exclusively Craigslist and we filled all of our apartments on that. It's kind of crazy. All nighter. Get some Monica. Good luck slowing down after you have your built, built your turbo muscle. I know, right? Laura Samanigo, unfortunately in Florida, there are not that many insurance to select from. Yeah, I know they make homeowners replace 10 years roof, with 30 year life expectancy, just because they can. Yeah, sadly, I know. I think that the state is going to come up with their own option though. Um, or just hold the people that are leaving the state that much more accountable. Um, I get not wanting to participate in the market, but you can't participate in this part of the market, not this part of the market. So, you know, I get it. I, it does make sense that they would hold some of those companies more accountable. I like that. Uh, SK, my rental unit is ready to move in section eight prospect reached out. I'm concerned if section eight process may take long. Uh, the, the very first one does the very first one does because you have to, um, you know, meet all the, uh, HCV specialists, not meet them, but like via email and coordinate everything and get somebody in there. But think about it this way. It's also stickier. So it's why tenants don't move as often, right? They don't want to move as often. So it does take a process, but once you're in the system, once you have a HAP contract, then it's very, very, very simple. Because then at that point, what I do is I reach out to the house, housing vouchers, housing choice vouchers folks. So I reach out to them in the conversation that I then have with them. I say, hey, we would love to be a part of um, the program that you have when you do your uh, uh, voucher briefings. So please, if you know that people hit this criteria or if people are looking for X, Y, Z size of a bedroom, we actually tell them, Hey, we've got like pretty much every 10 to 10 days to two weeks, come up, Hey, we have a, a two bedroom coming. Here's the application for it. If you have anybody that's looking for that, please feel free to send that out. One of the powerful things about having a property manager, um, software, not person. 
So they just get that link. They just forward it to anybody that's looking for a two bedroom. We make it super easy for them to fill our units and do their job, which is getting people housed. Um, and when they say, oh, hey, you know, uh, this person applied and they said they didn't get the apartment. I was like, it criteria based. They didn't meet our qualifications. They don't even argue with us now. They're just like, oh, man. OK, all right. Well, is it still available? And we'll say, yeah, it is. No, it isn't. Sometimes it is. Sometimes it isn't. Guess what we do? We say, yeah, feel free to take the link and send it out. And then I'll follow up with them in 10 days and say, hey, did you send that link out to anybody in the last week? But more often than not, our units are getting rented. So even our even in the winter, we rented out a $2,200 a month two bedroom yesterday in the winter time, like the week after the week after New Year's. A little bit crazy. Hey, John Williams. Good morning, sir. Good to have you. Um, all nighter. Now that's powerful negotiating, Matt. Tracking the amount you've paid the insurance company. Yeah, like honest to God, honest to God. Like they quickly forget that Every year, one of my companies, every year, my premium with them is like 70 grand. And then I have another one where the premium is like 26 now. It's insane. Um, REI Cerners, I'm here. Been listening to Christmas live and realized there was a live. Well, good to have you here. Working but here, REI Cerners, words of a true landlord. Working but here. Um. Robert Farinelli, do you need to pull a permit to add a bedroom if you are not altering anything structural? Um, no. You'll have to go through the process. Um, no. You don't need, I mean, you can use it as a three bedroom. If you want to, um, if you want to change the description, um, if you want to change the description of it, when you go to sell it, then usually you have to go through at least a little bit of a process so they can come out and see that it still meets all the fire code and stuff, fire and safety. That's what we do in our smaller cities. Oh, excuse me. That's what we do in the smaller cities. I don't know what they do in Manch Vegas. Um, all nighter. Hey, millennial Mike, it's pushups day. Get some boy. It's always pushups day for Mike. He'll, he'll be sorry. He sent me that picture. Yep. Uh, LOL. Uh, Rob, LOL. I thought the stream froze. No, nope. it's just me tending, tending to some malcontent. Um, he went over the top in the last, in the last couple of statements. So I had to flag him. Um, SK, I get a couple of applicants for my rental on Zillow who never took the time to come and see the rental. Yep. Do you ignore such applications? When do you respond to my message to visit the property? Um, I always, you know what? I mean, I think, so I have an agent now that does that, but she does it to the process that I have, which is what is written in the course and done in the course. Um, it's a tough time of year. I mean, I'd probably give it, you know, I reach out to them the first time. Then I reach out to them a second time, maybe a couple of days later saying, Hey, we're doing an open house. Want to make sure that you can take a look, uh, you know, as, as it appears as though you might be qualified, please let me know if you're still interested. And then if nothing after that, then they either aren't interested or they found another place or they're busy with something else. That's usually how I feel about it. Um, area centers. Holy smokes, guys. Looks like we have a tenant. They want to pay the deposit and hold the unit for peace of mind. Wasn't expecting that. Congratulations. That's awesome. We do have that happen. We do have that happen. Yep, for sure. Good. Congratulations, Joss. Well done. You did it. Well done. Um, Rob, yeah, that's the problem with your early 30s. Uh, you still believe in your push-up stays. <laughs> that's, that's from Mike. Uh, all Nighter Hider. Uh, LOL. The work boat I want to buy is 250K. Yep, some salmon boats are over 1.2 million now. Yeah just because guys will agree to pay that much. That's exactly right. Totally agree. It's worth what somebody's willing to pay for it. And the boat market speaks nicely of that. Uh, Frank Contreras. Hey, Frank. Good to have you back on Sunday. Good to see you, my friend. Um, Robert Farinelli, two five-eighths drywall in my bathroom last week. Terrible first drywall experience. To make it easier, I cut the drywall a little shorter and filled the gap with fire-rated expansion foam. Good or bad idea? I mean, it's fine if you can't tell. Like, I would still rather 
cut it to the right size. Like I said, I, I, yeah, I, I would be, I would be doing the block idea or something like that. Like what Hyder talked to you about. If you can't fit, um, if you can't fit a, a lift in there, but I mean, but yeah, I mean, the big thing is the edge. Then you just have to tape it. And so we, when sometimes when we have existing baseboard left in a place, sometimes what we'll do is we will cut, we will cut down to the baseboard, lay them plaster and things like that. And then when we have them mount the plaster or when we have them put the sheetrock in there, we then just have them tape it to the trim. We've done that in jobs before. So yeah, so we've seen that before. Yep. Uh, on that, I had it Rob. My dad beat me at the age of 69. I did 636. He did 648 pushups in an hour. Put me to shame as I am 38 years younger. Dude, that's nuts. That's a lot of pushups. I don't think I've done that many pushups in the last year. So congratulations on that. Robert Farinelli, for some reason with a dimpler bit uh, on my drill, I couldn't get the second layer drywall to screw uh, uh, screws to go in correctly for the life of me. All of them were sticking out a bit. Yeah, so it could be uh, uh, impact driver, using it better using an impact driver. Um, it could also be using a better sleeve on the, on the screw. Um, there's a reason why those sheetrock guys Poo, poo, poo. Sounds like an auto garage. There's a reason that they do it that way. And then it's like, there's your sound effects for the day. Um, but that stuff, you know, it's getting that when it's actually, you know, now countersunk into the, into the sheetrock, but then also stopped because it's hit the appropriate amount of resistance. So, um, so yeah, that does tend to happen. Um, Jay Caesar. Uh, should I wait for better times to buy? Nothing makes sense right now. Maybe soft and economy in 2024 will bring lower rates and better deals. It is still pricey here in Salt Lake City. Totally agree. Caesar, Jay Caesar, welcome to the channel. Happy to have you. Um, what I would probably be looking at is I'd be looking at other assets um, for sure. I would definitely be looking at other assets, but I'm sure as newer investors, you don't need 10 deals a year. You need one. What you have to do is, is you have to be on the hunt like a seasoned investor. If you're hunting like a seasoned investor, there are deals that they will say no to because they don't make enough. However, for a new investor, it's a million times better than what they're going to find on MLS. It's that much better of a product. So I would say, um, look to earlier in the video, I give the three ways that you can create opportunities in this market. Look at that piece and let me, and try all three of those. Try all three of those honestly for a month and see if you haven't gotten at least one or two opportunities come across your desk that, that makes sense. Um, Antonio. So I'm looking to build a six unit condo in the next two years. Love that. And I'm wondering if you would invest $1 million in that type of a project or buy two to three duplex instead. I'm based in New Hampshire as well. Antonio, great question. Thank you as always for the offer. Um, I don't, so I don't build from scratch. I've had the opportunity a couple of times. And what I've done is I've taken that, I've gotten all the approvals and everything else. And then I've sold it. Um, and the reason why that is, is because it's very heavy and capital intensive. So here's a quick example. So, and here's why I wouldn't invest, but thank you for the offer. Um, if I put a million dollars up in that, by, by definition, that million dollars that I'll have in that project will be tied up for quite some time. Um, you know, maybe a year, right? So it'll be tied up for a year. And then the opportunity is, okay, then what do I do? Do I sell? Well, maybe the market's not very good. Do I refi? Maybe the market's not very good. Maybe rates are super high. Maybe values have crashed. Possible. Maybe they've just corrected and they're down 10 to 20%. And so what happens is, is I don't need it to crash to not be able to get an exit. Here's what happens. They go down 10 or 15%, but the bank is nervous. So then the bank says, well, we're not going to give you an 80, 20 loan to value. Even though it's brand new, we're going to give you 60, 20 loan to value. So the problem is through no fault of my own, just because time passed, I have a million dollars locked up. Here's what I do. I spend that million dollars. It doesn't buy me three duplexes. It buys me closer to seven. That million bucks gives me enough money to buy seven duplexes because the value and, and the loan to value is never in question on a duplex. It's 20, 
land, construction, it might be 50, it might be 55, it might be 60%. And that's one of the things that scares me about these projects is that they take a lot longer. There's a lot more capital there and my capital is dead. It's not making any money. It's happening at an event as opposed to the opposite of my portfolio where it happens on the reg. So when I buy a duplex or seven of them, when I buy those duplexes, even if I overpay a little bit, I'm going to make 10, 15, 20% of my money. And a year later, maybe they're worth more, maybe they're worth less. It doesn't matter because I got it frozen in time at a minimum what my income is going to be. That's what makes it really awesome. So that's, that's the way I look at it, Antonio. That's why I've kind of built my portfolio the way that I have. But again, appreciate the offer. Flavio Macias, thank you. Uh, thanks for all your advice. I just gave, I just saved 6K quoting with five different contractors on my sewer line. Flavio, good for you, Flavio. That is awesome. That is awesome. Well done. Good for you. Uh, all Nighter Hider, Robert. I won't use those bits. If you can set the clutch to break, yep, at the right torque, that may be better for you. Yep, exactly right. Concur. Curtis Garner, howdy from Tacona. Howdy. Uh, will you be in person at the event, at the Robin Hood event on the 19th or 21st? I will not be in person. Will not be in person. Still have a job. And I'm already flying out to the One Rental at a Time event in Vegas just like three or four weeks later. So I won't be there in person, but I will be there uh, presenting. Or I will be, I will be there presenting, just not in person. Um, yes, thank you, Hyder. Hyder's fantastic. He knows all. He knows exactly what my schedule is. I'm on your mic. Hyder and I are going to do push-ups live streams in Vegas. I will suffer. That is good. That is how winning is done. It's also how losing is done, Mike. It's also how losing is done. You will suffer. You will lose. And I would still bet that you're not getting to 600. I'll still put my money on Hyder on 600. Yep. Robert Farinelli, all nighter. Next time I might not just cheap out and buy a drywall gun. Yeah. You can rent a drywall gun. Robert, you don't have to buy one. Rent it. You can rent it right from um right from a rental place, like a tri rental, a tailor rental, um, a um a Home Depot. Home Depot has them. Rent it. You can rent it for like a day. It's it might be 10 or 15 bucks, 17 bucks, something like that. Um, Antonio, where do you find properties that are going in the auction or better deals than, than what you see on Zillow? So I covered that earlier in the video, Antonio, definitely re-review the video. I gave top three, spent about six or seven minutes on it. So I don't want to give that again. Um, but auctions as well. Yeah. I watch auctions. There's just, you know, there's some there, but they are so outrageously overpriced. They are so not anywhere near closing you know, like maybe 10% of the deals right now that are going to auction on like auction.com and Zoom and things like that. Only about 10% of them are actually closing. Most of them aren't. Um, let's... You're not getting to 700, bro. Millennial Mike, love you like a brother. You're not getting to 700. Not by the time Vegas comes. SK. In 2023, what's been your time slip percentage between acquisition, stabilization, optimization? It appears that property management takes the most time, but want to hear from you. SK, well, great question. It's going up on the screen. Great question. Um, right now, I would say, so acquisition this year, it wasn't much. It was, it was less than 10% was acquisition. Um, stabilization was... 70%, a lot of it was stabilization. Then the remaining 20 was optimization. Yeah, it's mostly stabilization. Because stabilization, I consider, when we're going through and gutting a unit because we're you know going to get great tenants in there, like I'm trying to stabilize the asset, which means regular cash flow coming in. So that's the way that we do it. Oh, dear God. Come on, Millennium Mike. Now I have to scroll down and see the super chat. 50 bucks says I get to 700 in an hour on a live stream. No one trash talks me. Here's my 50. You can take it. You can take me to the Bellagio buffet again. <laughs> I don't think you do it, Mike. 700 in an hour. 
in an hour. How many times does that mean you have to get to, you get to stop? And, uh, and Mike, we are talking about real pushups, not like from the knees where like you play golf from the other tees. Just saying. Freaking like hilarious. It's not trash talking. It's just recognizing that I don't think you can do 700 pushups in an hour. Uh, a person, a person. Good to have you. Uh, is a commercial lease that has a flat rent, but also percentage of revenue from the business, a red flag for a potential buyer of the building. Um, it's not a red flag, but I really want to understand it. You know, especially going into a softer economy. Yishka. Oof. Going into a softer economy. That's a little bit scary for me. Won't lie. Won't lie. Percentage of income. Hmm. Yeah. I mean, not a red flag, but definitely one that needs a lot of investigation. Who knows if the owner of the place passes away, if their top sales guy leaves, um, if their top crew leaves, you know, where does that leave you? If, if that's the, uh, you know, cause in a commercial lease, if you're not bringing in the, you know, 1.3% of global debt, if you're not bringing in that much, the bank can then put you in technical default. So that's where, that's where I would get nervous about that. A person. That's a great question. Great question. Those leases are pretty rare. Don church. Do you typically hold open houses? Yes, I do. I have a new rental almost done. Partner has a list of 10 questions. And if the answer correctly, they can come to the open house thoughts. I would cut down the number of questions. Um, what you want to do is, um, I, I say, uh, you know, limited space available in this or for this open house. Um, please answer the four questions listed in the application um, in order to get a number to attend the event. Um, please note that you must qualify in order to, to attend the event. That's what I do. Ten's way too many. It needs to be three or four. What are the three? You don't have 10 questions that you would base a rental on. So the thing that I would look at if I were in your shoes is I would look at what are the four that make you say no? Right. That's what I want to look at. That's my thought, Don. Um, Millennial Mike. Well, now I have to get to 700. It's pretty funny. Um, pro tip. If a drywall piece is too big to enter the room, score the backside. Yep, exactly. Uh, where a stud or joist will fill that fill and fold. Yep. Place piece in half. Exactly right. Or just cut it in half. An extra joint is usually worth the saved work. I agree. You're going to be mudding and taping anyway. Uh, Antonio, what do you see in NH's opportunities this year and in upcoming years? What towns do you prefer and what do you look for? Um, I know my three towns inside and out. I don't know any other towns in New Hampshire. Um, Landlord Odyssey knows um, knows Keene. Um, Robert Farinelli knows Manchester um, and Nashua. Um, um, my buddy Josh knows Atkinson. Um, another one of my buddies knows Ho Hooks It. Um, so I don't know. I only know what my three are and my three are the same that they always are, which is I only buy fantastic deals. Ones that have a lot of opportunity for upside. So I don't have a specific town. Hey, I would look here. Um, I think that you have to learn what type of a tenant that you want. You know, Manchester can offer high end tenants, can offer low end tenants, can offer section eight tenants. Um, it can offer blue collar. It can offer white collar. It just depends on what type of asset you're buying. So I don't think there's a hard and fast answer of here's where I would look. Um, but there's a hard and fast answer on here's the criteria I would use to decide. Uh, Robert Farinelli, drywall guns wired, uh, only cost a hundred bucks. I think I'll buy versus 15 bucks a day. Exactly. Easy enough. It's math X number of pushups per minute or two. Yeah. So, I mean, basically you're looking at to get to 700, you got to basically do 12 a minute. So that might not be that hard now that I think about it. Hard for me, not hard for SWAT guy. He's SWAT. Like, but yeah, 12 a minute. Cause you could probably bang out 20 in the first minute pretty easily. I wonder when fatigue would set in. I don't know. It's going to be interesting to watch. Don't know that I watched the whole live stream, but I certainly will skip to the end. Um, Antonio, what do you think about, oh, actually it's 108. All right, I'm going to finish these. Hold on one second. Last. 
I'll finish these. Mm -hmm. um, Antonio, what do you think about STR New Hampshire? Hate it. And especially in the Lakes region and up north. Hate them. How about towns like Durham and Portsmouth for properties? Hate them. Hate them. Hate them. Hate them. I hate Dur Durham and Portsmouth because working with the city of Durham is a nightmare. So I was working with the city of Portsmouth. They're a little bit better than Durham, but not much. Um, the cost is absolutely outrageous. Um, I see buildings down there that do 10 and 12,000 bucks a month, but they're worth 3 million bucks. I have buildings that are a million dollars that do 10,000 bucks a month. I'd rather have a cheaper asset that does, that throws off that kind of cash. Um, Robert Farinelli, uh, works better for me. Sometimes uh, I only work for a couple hours after work. Exactly. 11.6 a minute. Yeah. 12. You can't do 0.6 pushups, Mike. Uh, all nighter hider. Yes. Real plank body, no locked elbow pushups. Yep. Just saying. Yep. Just math, but sounds impressive and does take work. Uh, thank you for my first super check tax write off of 2024 douche. <laughs> Just telling you, Mike, O'Doyle rules. O'Doyle rules. Um, Rob, uh, I'm going to, I'm not going to trash talk Mike on this one. I've retired from pushups myself. Nice. Uh, Hey, Corby Carter mentioned you earlier, Corby with your swan concept. I love it. Um, let's see. Uh, last one. When you refi a single family, how much closing costs do you typically pay? My rate is 10 and a half. Holy Lord. And I'm being offered seven, six, five with one year prepay worth to wait for rate to lower further in next quarter. I never, I can never guess what rates are going to do. I don't really run my business that way. Time in the market better than timing the market. It depends on, I mean, 10 and a half is what you're paying now and you're being offered seven, six, five with a one year prepay. Is it a one year prepay or one point? Uh, if you answer SK, I'll answer. Um, Cause I'm trying to answer your question. One year prepay. Hmm. I don't think I'd do that. Hmm. I don't think I'd do that. I think I'd be shopping for other debt. I would be talking to as many people as you can talk to. I would talk to Matt, the mortgage guy. Um, absolutely. You know, you need to be working with a more conventional letter. And I would also be using the opportunity to call other local small banks and have conversations with them. That's what I would do. Other local small banks have conversations with them and just say, Hey, this is what the asset is. Here's much cash flow it makes. Here's what it cash flows today at 1065 or 105. What's the best rate? Because you can probably get in there at low sevens. I just did a deal at seven. Well, is that really a yeah? I mean it is. I mean, I'm signing paperwork. I've done the deal for a while. Um, so yeah. A friend of mine just got a 699 on her investment rental. Exactly. Yep. Yep, absolutely. No points. This locks me for one year with a prepay. I don't know, SK. I don't like lock-in stuff. I don't like lock-in stuff. But you can. I see it both ways, right? Like, it's impossible to say. A year from now, you might look really smart. A year from now, you might look really wrong. You know, it's impossible to say. You know, if we go into war, if there's so many variables of what could happen with rates this year, you know, if we go into recession and we know, you know, is Q4, did that put us in a recession? Are we in Q, are we in recession from Q4 and GDP? No, probably not. That means that we have to see how the first quarter of this year goes, then next quarter. And so a recession wouldn't be announced until like July or August. Uh, yeah, that's where, I mean, would you be happy at the 765? for multiple years or for at least a year depends on how much it's costing you to close i guess like if you're bumping into the 765 and it's not really costing you a whole lot to close and the only thing that you have to do it's not costing you out of money you just have to pay them the 765 for a year like maybe that's worth it um can i go to the same lender today shell point and see if they can lower rate without hassle yeah you can absolutely ask them yep you can just say, hey, what you want to do is you want to call a couple of other people, give them the scenario and just say, can you give me, you know, what you think I would be at? Um, because if you have it in black and white, it's far better if you have it in black and white from another company. 
you know, from another company. So say 765, 30 year fixed, get somebody else to quote you at 7725. And then you can say, I'll do the 725 with you, but I want the one year prepayment eliminated. Lots of flexibility there on how you negotiate that. So I hope you guys all had an absolutely fantastic week. I had a great time with you in our live stream today. It's 115. Want to get up to my kiddos. Um, I've got jury duty tomorrow. Ooh. Yeah. So I will tell you next week how that went, but I hope you guys have a fantastic week. And uh, SK, let me know how it goes. Guys, have an absolutely great, great week of investing. And again, please learn more so you can earn more. And don't forget Lumberjack landlord the um the boot camp is going to 995 um we had since the announcement uh two or three days ago we have i think 10 spots available 10 spots in the second i'm going to run them in tandem let me explain that real quick it makes sense that i explain that we have i'm going to be running them in tandem that way and they'll be the same week they're not going to be off weeks so as an example if we pick that we're going to run it let's say these aren't the days because we're going to run a poll, but we're going to pick the top two results. So let's say it's Tuesday nights and Sunday earlier mornings or Sunday afternoons or whatever that number looks like. That means what we'll do is we'll run week one of the course, but both of those classes will be week one. And so you'll get to pick which one you go to. That way, if you're busy on Sundays, no big deal. If you're busy on Tuesdays, no big deal. If some plans come up, we, you, you, you got to go away for a, whatever, a couple of days and you can attend the other one. Want to try and give you flexibility. We're going to see how that works. Hopefully that works well. Um, but yeah, we're going to, so we have 10 more spots open total. Um, I think it's 26 are taken, 25, 26 are taken. Um, so we have 10 more spots open total for one of those two nights or days, um, which we, after we, after everybody wraps up or after we basically close out registration for that, we're targeting um, beginning of February for that actually. So targeting beginning of February for that. Um, and like I said, then you'll get to pick one of the days that you want to go in, whichever one you want to go in, you can take. And so it's flexible, um, but it will also, we'll take a poll once, uh, once it's full, we'll take a poll of what works for everybody. And then the top two that get the most votes, it'll be those. And that way people can alternate back and forth unless we see like an anomaly, like the third one is all of the people that couldn't make either of the other ones is going. And then we'll figure out how we do that, where we'll just make that that the night or day or afternoon. So anyway, hopefully you guys have an absolutely fantastic week. Um, like I said, please check out the course. Let me know how that goes and have an absolutely fantastic week. Thanks everybody. Take care.